Hi, everyone. Hope you had a great start to the day and welcome to joint AMO and SIGRE Australia System Strength Workshop. My name is Babak Badzadeh and I have the pleasure of coordinating this workshop for you. The first point I wanted to mention is that the whole six and a half hours of the workshop will be recorded, which will become available sometime next week. The workshop comprises five sessions with pre-recorded presentations with each session having a dedicated Q&A. I have to apologize in advance for the short lunch break of approximately 25 minutes, and this is the only break during this workshop. Shortly, we'll provide you a link to a quick survey, and we'd be grateful to have your feedback. Now, as briefly mentioned, the workshop is divided into five sessions. This is the first session aiming to set out some of the backgrounds and fundamental principles. We'll then have three separate sessions for each of the connections, operations, and planning streams. Our last session provides an overview of what is happening internationally, also in academia. The idea of having such a workshop was first discussed in Australian Power System Modeling Reference Group. At the time, our intention was to hold a number of face-to-face -face workshops in major Australian cities anticipating to attract up to 300 attendees. At the same time, SIGRE at the international level requested Andrew Halley of TAS Networks and myself to coordinate a system strength workshop for SIGRE Paris 2020 session, which subsequently converted to an e-session due to COVID-19. A four-hour workshop was delivered with pre-recorded presentations and live Q&A opportunities for an international audience primarily with some Australian contents. This workshop attracted approximately 130 attendees and its success further motivated us to apply the same virtual format to the Australian System Strength Workshop. We made a couple of key changes to the Australian System Strength Workshop. The first was to make sure that all industry sectors who might have a complementary perspective are included and each organization can share their unique views and experiences. Because of this, we determined the need for a full day workshop as opposed to a half day for the SIGRE e-session. The second key change was to make sure that presentations as far as possible are pitched towards both engineers and non-engineers alike considering the high impact of system strength matters on both technical and non-technical aspects. It was our view that this diversity and inclusion would not only help promoting a common understanding of various aspects of system strength, it would also provide a strong platform on what the gaps could be and how industry, academia, and governments can all work together to achieve an outcome that everyone desired and everyone would be proud of achieving. I'd like to point out that uh, all meeting attendees will be muted for this workshop. You can use the WebEx built-in Q&A facility to type your questions, which can be done at any time during this workshop rather than waiting at the end of each session. Note that the chat facility is disabled for this workshop. On exception, one of the workshop hosts uh, can unmute a person asking a question, for example, if we need further clarification on the questions asked. I have to apologize in advance that uh, we most likely won't be able to answer all questions, and there is a good reason for this. Well, the key reason is that we have more than 1,100 registered attendees, which has far exceeded our expectations. We are, though, very pleased to see that not only there are strong attendances from various industry sectors, there are also very solid participations from governments and academia. For today's workshop, we have 23 panelists from 14 Australian organizations and another five international panelists. Lastly, I'd like to thank SIGRE Australia for facilitating this workshop and supporting us every step of the way. Also, my colleagues at AMO for helping immensely in organizing this workshop. Last but not the least to all presenters. I know fitting all your ideas and great work in 10 minutes is a non-trivial task. 
on that note, I hope everyone really enjoyed this workshop and talk again soon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alex Wonas, and I am responsible for system design and engineering at AMO. Now, it's really fantastic to see that Seagray has taken a real leadership role and brought you all together to discuss the very important topic of system strength. Now, in my view, system strength is arguably the final frontier that we have to master to make the energy transition happen. And today, I wanted to share with you why I believe that. Australia is at the forefront of energy transitions globally. We are currently experiencing the world's fastest transition when measured in per capita renewable capacity as additions. And I'm allowed to say that because I'm German, other countries are not even coming close. Because when you look at last year's data, Australia has installed about 250 watts of capacity per capita, whereas Germany, uh, the next one up, is currently installing less than half of that. Now, what that means is nothing short of a phenomenal transformational change that we need to manage. And we have seen that over the last three years in the NEM, because we have seen an almost 1,000% increase in the number of large-scale solar farms from 6 to 52. And at the same time, we have also seen an almost doubling of the number of wind farms from 36 to 58. So when you look at the current rate of capacity additions across the NEM, which is about 3 gigawatts uh, per annum, that is exceeding even AEMO's step change scenario, which would only require about two and a half gigawatts uh, of capacity per year. And that trajectory would get us to a um, renewable penetration of well above 90% over the next 20 years. So that is a really profound change. What that means for us as a country is that we are also often experiencing the novel and frankly challenging issues first and have to find a solution. So for us, the question really is, how do we manage this transition while keeping the system secure and also equally importantly, consumer prices low? This is where the integrated system plan or ISP comes in and other related studies such as the renewable integration study. These studies aim to provide the roadmap for Australia's energy transition. So over the past 18 months, we have consulted intensively with over 200 stakeholders to define scenarios, develop assumptions, and frankly, test our thinking. For those of you who have participated in this, I wanted to thank you because without you, it would not have been possible uh, to do all of this work. So we have taken into account tens of megabytes of different uh, input factors ranging from technology costs, fuel costs, possible network expansion options, and of course, consumer investments into DER. And we spent a very significant amount on you know, cloud computing to develop ultimately five scenarios and explore many more sensitivities in the ISP to describe the future energy scenarios of Australia. As an example, here's what we see in the central scenario. The driving force of a lot of the change is, as you all know, the retirements of coal generators. We are seeing about 15 gigawatts of capacity exiting over the next 20, uh, 20 years, which represents roughly 63% of the installed coal-fired capacity. That lost energy will be replaced by a very significant uptake of distributed energy resources in that scenario around 200%. But that on itself is not enough we also require about 26 gigawatts of um, large-scale variable renewable energy resources to make up for the energy and to ensure that we can at all times meet uh, demand. We also need up to 19 gigawatts of new dispatchable resources. If we do this transition well, we have actually seen that we, this could save about $11 billion in net market benefits to consumers um, compared to a scenario where we actually don't invest in the 
necessary augmentation of the transmission system because that's one of the exam questions of the ISP. So the real question here, what is then the biggest challenge in this transition given that we have this plan? Many people are surprised to hear that the answer to this question is not what do we do when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. You probably understand that. But I believe the answer to the question of what is the single biggest challenge during this transition is how do we integrate these vast amounts of renewables and in particular inverter-based renewables securely into the, into the system. So let's go through the integration challenges step by step. Um, the first one is ensuring that we balance supply and demand. That is relatively straightforward because we can project future demand, hopefully get that right, and then we can relatively easily derive the necessary supply requirements for the system. All we need is the right market mechanism to drive them into the market. Then secondly, we need to actually manage a much greater amount of uncertainty and variability. And in particular, ramping becomes um, a very significant challenge that we need to manage. But when you boil it down, it again comes down to good forecasting of the ramping requirements and again creating the right market mechanisms to ensure that we have the resources available if and when we need it. Next is managing frequency and inertia. Again, this is mainly a forecasting and market incentive problem. And we are very, very fortunate that nowadays we have a phenomenal new tool in our toolbox in the form of battery. Which leaves us last, but certainly not least, um, with system strength. The challenge with system strength even starts by coming up with what is the common definition of what we actually mean by system strength. So after a lot of debate, we have now settled that we want to define it as the ability of the system to maintain the voltage waveform and its phase angle. That is quite different to a lot of the other properties that we often um, use to quantify the power systems, such as power and frequency. They are all physical properties. However, system strength is actually an emergent property of the system, which results from the interaction from nowadays millions of different devices across the system. And some of the uh, quantities that we use traditionally to describe system strengths, such as fault current or short circuit ratios, are actually only proxies. Um, and in particular, as inverter-based resources are growing in their, uh, in their uptake in the system, uh, they will become increasingly poor proxies for system strength. So that leaves us with the next question, what is actually the state of system strength across the NEM? I'm afraid to say that the state of system strength is not at all pretty. Today, we already have very weak levels of system strength in almost all locations where renewable resources are good. It's almost the inverse of resource quality. And the exit of the large synchronous units who have traditionally provided system strengths hasn't even started yet. So as a result of that extremely weak system that we're already facing, um, for example, in the West Murray zone um, that some of you will be um, sadly familiar with, many projects are experiencing incredibly painful delays in, for example, their connection project process which is an absolutely awful situation that we have to address with urgency. Unfortunately, to date, we only have some fairly pedestrian solutions, such as the deployment of synchronous condensers, but they only provide a band-aid, but nevertheless, we are obviously starting to apply this band-aid. Um, there are some new approaches emerging. Uh, for example, some of the uh, very uh, advanced inverter tuning that has solved some of the challenges in the West Murray zone. But I certainly hope that today will help us to increase our understanding um, of system strength and most importantly, to, to develop some better solutions for the future. In particular, I would really encourage you 
to help us find answers to three critical questions. The first one is how do we actually um, measure system things better in the system? The second is how do we model it efficiently, taking the ever increasing complex interplay of generators into account? And possibly most importantly, and thirdly, how do we provide system things through generators and networks using the new technologies and new approaches that um, the latest generation uh, of technology um, offers to us. So I really look forward to your insight on these topics um, and I wish us well to navigate the transition of the Australian energy system. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is David Bones, and I am the chairman of the Seagray Australia Technical Committee. On behalf of Seagray Australia, I am very pleased to welcome you all to this virtual workshop. I would like to start by thanking the BAC and the team at AEMO for bringing this workshop together and for the support provided by all of the speakers who will present today. Across the day, I am sure we will all develop a much deeper understanding of what is meant by system strength learn about the key challenges that arise when operating power systems with low system strength, and develop a better understanding of some of the emerging regulatory and technical solutions. The workshop today builds on a similar workshop delivered during the 2020 Paris e-session in August this year. We have added additional material to focus on the issues that are here and now for the Australian power system. It is great to see the diversity of speakers that have volunteered their time today to share their knowledge and experience with us. I would like to take a few moments now to share with you the history of Seagray's involvement in the study of system strength. The story not only provides an interesting backdrop for today's workshop, it also provides a great illustration of the value that Seagray provides to the power industry. The story begins back in 2012 in Australia. If you cast your mind back to those days, system strength was nowhere near as prominent an issue as it is today. However, we were seeing a trend of large scale renewable generators, mainly wind farms, connecting into fairly remote parts of the power system. Those areas of the power system were characterised by lower short circuit ratios and often referred to as, as weak parts of the network. A number of Australian Seagrain members identified the need for research to provide guidance uh, for the Australian power industry into how best to assess the impact of renewable generators when connecting into weak parts of the power system. A working group was proposed and presented to study committee B4, which in those days was mainly focused on high voltage DC systems. The study committee saw some synergies between the proposed scope of work, noting that there was an increasing trend towards renewable generators being connected by inverter-based systems. The working group got underway in 2012 and was led by Nalan Palamotha. Nalan had been the convener of the Australian B4 panel and served as the Australian representative on the International Study Committee. And with him acting as a convener, that provided a direct path uh, for Australian uh, engineers to influence the direction uh, that the working group uh, took. The working group consolidated information from around the world and produced a technical brochure, 671, in 2016. As it turns out, 2016 was a pivotal year for the Australian power sector. The South Australian blackout in September of that year created intense focus on the challenges uh, associated with uh, connecting greater levels of renewable generation and maintaining a secure power system. There were many outcomes from the reviews of the 2016 blackout, one of which was the introduction of the system strength framework into the national electricity rules. A key requirement of the NER framework was to develop a guideline defining how to effectively assess when a generator connection might give rise to adverse system strength impacts. 
AEMO was charged with the creation of the guideline and was able to leverage the early work that had been undertaken by Seagray and published in Technical Brochure 671. That same technical brochure has been referenced by a number of other organisations around the world, including the North American Electricity Reliability Corporation in their June 27 Reliability Guideline, covering the integration of inverter-based resources into weak power systems. This story shows that through active involvement in Seagray, Australian members are able to use Seagray's international network to undertake focused research answer some very relevant questions and deliver value for Australia. The Seagray System Strength story is however far from over and I know that Andrew Halley has a presentation later today to provide an overview of some of the ongoing work that Seagray is doing in this area and through that presentation you'll all have a chance to understand how you can get involved in that work. I would like to conclude there and hand back to Babak to get us started with the first technical presentation for the day. Thank you very much, and once again, welcome to the workshop. Hi everyone again. In this presentation, I'll provide an overview of different components of system strength and how all presentations in the workshop will come together. While I appreciate the title of this presentation might be rather unusual, Please be rest assured that all I'll be talking about is power system rather than astrology, theology, or geometry. The terms quincunx and trinity will be used several times in this presentation, which are essential to describe the interrelationship between various aspects of system strength. For consistency, we define these terms in this slide. A quincunx is a geometric pattern consisting of five points arranged in a cross, with four of them forming a square or a rectangle, and a fifth at its center. A trinity is a group of three closely related persons or things. Another definition of trinity is the state of being three. The term trilemma has been used in the energy industry many times in recent years, which is indeed the exact opposite of a trinity. This is very important in the context of system strength, as trinities mean more diversity, more flexibility, more options, and more inclusiveness. Thinking of it as a trilemma, on the other hand, would mean that we might be unnecessarily removing some of the options and solutions. Note that this is the last time we talk about the term trilemma in this presentation. The first of our five trinities is the type of generation technologies and what it means from a system strength perspective. Generation technologies can be divided into synchronous and inverter based resources. Synchronous machines consist of synchronous generators and synchronous condensers. Inverter-based resources can be divided into traditional or grid-following and emerging or grid-forming inverters. Synchronous machines have the advantage of creating their own voltage source and don't generally require a particular number of synchronous machines or a particular fault level to operate stably. However, this doesn't mean that they are immune to low system strength problems. Traditional grid following inverters used in inverter-based resources or IBR have been around for a few decades. Unlike synchronous machines, they need a sufficient number of nearby synchronous machines to operate stably. However, the strength of the power system and the number of nearby synchronous machines and interconnecting lines is not the only factor that determines the stability. Design and tuning of control systems deployed in the IBR has an equally important role to play that will be discussed in several presentations in this workshop. In an attempt to address some of the challenges associated with traditional IBR under low system strength conditions, emerging technologies have been proposed in the past two to three years. They are referred to as grid forming inverters, although some of the evolutions of this concept are called virtual synchronous machines or similar terms. The idea is essentially to emulate the response of a synchronous machine 
as close as possible, despite still being an IBR. In today's workshop, we'll have various presentations on both the opportunities and challenges associated with each technology. While it is fair to say that uh, real and virtual synchronous machines are most often the solutions for low system strength conditions, it is not prudent to think of uh, any of these three types of generation technologies as always as the solution for system strength or always the cause of system strength adverse impacts. Also, where we observe low system strength conditions is not necessarily the location where the cause of adverse system strength impacts is located. Hence the delineations between the terms cause and symptom in this diagram. One of the common misunderstandings when talking about uh, cause, symptom, or solutions for system strength is about grid following inverters and the perception that they always adversely impact system strength. Our recent experience shows that they could sometimes provide positive contribution to the overall system strength. Detailed and deliberate design of inverter control system plays a significant part here. This will be discussed by several presenters today, including our two OEM representatives. The key message here is that while grid following inverters are usually one of the key causes of adverse system strength impacts, some of these problems could be addressed by grid following inverters themselves rather than requiring synchronous condensers or grid forming inverters for every single installation. The key takeaway from the first trinity is that each of the three generation technologies should be considered as a tool in the toolbox to provide extra flexibility in developing and deploying solutions. This way, we can maximize the distinct advantages of each technology in a complementary fashion. This slide summarizes key types of power system analysis carried out in any power system. These studies include power flow, fault level, stability, power quality, protection, and lastly, high frequency switching and lightning transients. Further details, and in particular, the implications of moving from a power system dominated by synchronous generators to that with high shares of IBR have been discussed in more details in a reference paper developed by a study committee C4 of SIGRE and published in issue 17 of SIGRE Science and Engineering Journal. The immediate question here is which of these analysis types matter most in the context of system strength, which we'll look at in the next slide. Selecting relevant parts of the previous diagram leads us to the second trinity, which is types of power system analysis required under low system strength conditions. These three aspects are stability, power quality, and protection. Several analyses have already been reported worldwide with regard to system stability issues when operating under low system strength conditions. However, the impact of low system strength on power quality and protection, and importantly, the interrelation between these three aspects hasn't been discussed widely. These three aspects will become increasingly interrelated as system strength declines. For example, a system stability problem could well manifest itself as a power quality concern and vice versa. The same applies on interrelationship between power system protection and power system stability. In today's workshop, not only we have several presentations on various aspects of system stability, there are also two presentations looking at the impact of low system strength on power quality and power system protection. System strength challenges and solutions are generally considered in three distinct timeframes, which are connections, operations, and planning. These forms are third trinity. Despite large degrees of commonalities between the three timeframes, some differences and uniqueness of each aspect are inevitable. For example, in operational timeframe, a constraint could be applied to limit the total megawatt output of an IBR or clusters of IBR or constraining the number of online inverters or turbines. 
this solution is most useful as an interim measure while other solutions are still being developed but cannot be considered as an appropriate solution for planning or connections timeframes. A refinement in connections and planning frameworks for system strength would certainly help minimizing system strength issues from being experienced in operational timeframes. However, it may not fully remove operational challenges. For example, the use of constraint could still be necessary under plan outage conditions. Outage planning is becoming increasingly more involved and complex due to the interplay with system strength, as we'll discuss uh, this afternoon. In today's workshop, we'll have three separate sessions on the impact of system strength on connections, operations, and planning. This will hopefully provide a better understanding of commonalities in terms of challenges and solutions applied to the three timeframes, but also unique aspects of each timeframe. The next trinity of system strength is the impact of generation mix and network topologies. The three main contributing factors include first IBR density, which accounts for concentration of several IBRs in close proximity of each other. Second, synchronous unit scarcity, which means lack of sufficient online synchronous generators due to retirements or market prices. And lastly, network sparsity, which reflects remoteness of the overall area to which IBRs are connected, how far they are with respect to major generation and load centers and how meshed and interconnected the area is. The impact of IBR density and synchronous unit scarcity are more widely discussed and perhaps better understood than the network sparsity. For this reason, we've tried to explore further this less understood aspect, and I'm glad to confirm that in today's workshop, Vestas' presentation will have some discussion on this specific aspect. These three factors don't necessarily coincide with each other, but when they do, system strength challenges would be generally greater. Depending on which one and how many of these factors are dominant, solutions required could be different, but there is no guaranteed solution to work for all conditions, and the best way to confirm the veracity of each solution for intended application is to perform detailed power system modeling and simulation. The last trinity is the key enablers for assessing and addressing system strength challenges. Accurate and fit for purpose modeling and monitoring tools allow us to assess and address system strength related phenomena, not just those that we are currently aware, but those that might be encountered moving forward as the share of IBR increases progressively. The use of appropriate modeling would ensure that problems are addressed well before they occur in real power system operation. To facilitate this objective, AIMO has recently completed the development of a full-scale electromagnetic transient or EMT model of NEM power system comprising more than 3000 bus bars and 200 dynamic models. We'll have a presentation this morning on some of the works we've been undertaking to provide access to the industry on this model also to increase the speed of simulation. As we'll discuss this afternoon, we've recently performed a few stage system testing to provide confidence in the accuracy of these models for operational connections and planning decision makings. Neither modeling nor observation alone is enough to take us where we want to be and the confidence level we need to have, hence the collective importance of the, these two aspects together. Refined regulatory frameworks allowing early identification of system strength challenges will assist in alleviating some of these challenges otherwise experienced in connection process or actual power system operation. After this presentation, Australian Energy Market Commission will take us through some of the work they've been doing in this space. Last but not the least, coordination is not only one of the key aspects of this particular trinity, but system strength as a whole. We can only achieve the most efficient and optimal outcome by coordination. This would apply to aspects such as coordination of analysis or solutions and coordination between different parties. 
No single organization has all the right tools and answers, and it is by coordination between all industry bodies, academia, and government that we can achieve an outcome uh, which we can all be proud of. I hope today's workshop will take us a step towards achieving this outcome. All right, let's bring everything together. We talk about the five trinities of system strength. As the name trinity stands, the three core components of each trinity can and perhaps should be achieved concurrently and in a coordinated fashion. Discarding some of the options, challenges, and solutions could hinder us from achieving the desired outcome. Let's try to make best use of everything available to us. This concludes my presentation. Hope you all will enjoy this workshop and keen to have an interactive uh, Q&A session. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is James Hyatt from the Australian Energy Market Commission. This session is on our work to evolve the system strength regulatory frameworks. Our agenda for this session is an introduction and overview of our investigation into the system strength frameworks in the NEM, which we completed in October. And in that, we made three key recommendations, which are our agenda items two, three, and four. One for the demand side, one for the supply side, and one for the efficient coordination of supply and demand. Finally, I'll walk you through the next steps for the AMC's work program on system strength. Some background on system strength is that it is an essential system service needed to support a secure and stable power system. The provision of system strength is becoming more important given the rapid connection of large numbers of new non-synchronous generation as we transition to a low emissions future. System strength was first considered by the AMC in 2017 when we introduced two new frameworks to manage this emerging problem. The first was the Do No Harm framework and the second was the Minimum System Strength framework. These have been, these were among the first of their type globally and were using the best knowledge and experience at the time. And historically, these frameworks have been successful at keeping the power system secure. However, as the power system has changed over time, new challenges have emerged and industry's understanding of system strength has evolved as we've implemented these frameworks. The Commission therefore initiated a review into the system strength frameworks in March this year with a discussion paper. We have now completed this investigation and made a series of recommendations that I want to talk to you about today. First and foremost, the Commission heard from stakeholders that there was a need to better understand the problem. System strength is an umbrella term for a number of power system phenomena. The AMC worked with AEMO, industry and our technical consultants, GHG, to refine the understanding of what a system strength service is. What we came up with is that a system strength service is related to the stability of the power system's voltage waveform. This means that voltage waveform stays regular and smooth and doesn't deform following disturbance. Now, there are three key power system concepts relevant to the stability of voltage waveform. The first is voltage waveform provision, which is the supply of a strong voltage waveform itself into the power system. Historically, this has been provided by synchronous machines like coal, gas, and hydro generators. The second is inverter driven stability, where inverter connected generators require a strong and stable voltage waveform to stay connected. Any disturbances to that voltage waveform therefore needs to be settled quickly and the system returned to a stable steady state. Network stability management is our third concept which has network plant and generator protection systems, which is critical to the safe operation of the power system requiring adequately damped voltage waveforms to operate effectively to clear faults following a disturbance in the power system. Now that we have this evolved definition, we have the way of evolving the system strength frameworks themselves as set out in our final report through a series of recommendations. As you can see on the right, we've coupled those three concepts further grouped into supply and demand of a system strength. What we then have is our three approaches to how to provide this service into the future. First is a supply side approach, which has the introduction of a new system strength planning standard. Then we have a demand side approach, which incorporates two new technical standards on new generators connecting to the power system. And in the middle, we have the way of coordinating the supply and demand side in an efficient manner, which is the introduction of a system strength mitigation requirement. 
the rest of my presentation will walk through each of these uh, recommendations in turn. Firstly, the demand side, the generator obligation. So the Commission recommended the incorporation of two new technical standards that would apply to new generators connecting to the power system. This will be such to efficiently manage their demand for system strength. The first access standard is a short circuit ratio or SCR, general capability of a new generator to be able to operate stably to a given level of system strength. The second is voltage shift, phase shift requirement, which would mean that generators would have to maintain continuous uninterrupted operation following a large shift in the phase of the voltage in the generating system. Now these new standards would not effectively apply to synchronous generating systems who already do these things and it would rely on the existing well-established access standards negotiation uh, process to determine the appropriate level for each of the generating systems connecting. In each case the Commission considers the inclusion of these two additional access standards will prom promote the national energy objective by which our decisions are governed by doing three things. Enhancing the security of the power system, lowering demand for system strength services, and increasing flexibility for the future. Now we are continuing to develop these proposed access standards, including the specific values associated with each of them, as well as the existing arrangements for damping, where we're looking at checking the requirements for connecting generators to provide damping capability of power system oscillations are the most appropriate to manage these inverter driven stability issues. We'll be consulting on a developed proposal in the transfer draft determination, which we'll be publishing in December of this year. Moving on to the supply side, a coordinated approach using a network planning standard. The Commission considers that a coordinated approach is the most effective way to supply system strength in the NAM, and this is currently what we have in the existing framework. We therefore recommended an evolution to the current frameworks, but to use a but instead to establish a network planning standard for system strength. This will proactively deliver volumes of system strength needed to facilitate the effective connection and operation of IVR to deliver lower cost energy to everyone. This standard will be part of the NER and leverage the existing network planning and economic regulatory arrangements. AEMO and TNSPs would plan the efficient level of system strength needed, with TNSPs then procuring the most efficient mix of solutions to meet that standard. This efficient level would include the services needed to maintain security, as under the existing frameworks, but would also require additional levels to alleviate constraints and facilitate the connection of inverter-based generators. The general idea of this network coordinated model is that it builds on the existing planning frameworks with clear responsibilities for both AEMO and TNSPs. It would place a central obligation on TNSPs to provide system strength subject to guidance from AEMO. TNSPs will be providing this level, as I said before, the total volume of system strength that is above what is currently provided, and not just that for system security needs, but also that for net market benefits. This system strength will be provided at select nodes throughout the grid, as identified by AEMO, where investment would be the most efficient. These areas are such, those such that large amounts of non-synchronous plant currently exist, where they are forecasted to connect or around load centers, such we have a strong backbone of the grid. A key part of this standard is the metric for it, the way that we measure system strength. And throughout the investigation, the commission has found that currently no single metric will capture all system strength issues experienced in the NEM, nor fully enable all potential new technologies or techniques to be used to address these issues. The Commission therefore recommends the metric of the standard uses a combination of available fault level or AFL accompanied by a criterion that TNSPs must maintain the stable operation of IBR generators. On AFL, it provides an accurate representation of the efficient level of system strength by describing the probability that system strength constraints occur on existing or forecast connections. AFL is already used by AEMO and is a well understood measure. On the IBR criterion, this would allow for all the different types of system strength solutions to be utilised by TNSPs. In particular, it would allow for those solutions that do not provide 
just fault current, such as collecting, generator, retuning, or grid forming inverters, which may be left out if you just use available fault level as the metric for the standard. We consider this combination, a combination approach to the metric for the standard to be comprehensive, simple, and flexible. Now, the new network planning standard will be part of the integrated planning processes that AMO and TNSPs have. AMO and TNSPs will still play a role as they do under the existing framework, with AMO forecasting the expected outcomes on the power system, particularly those expected new IBR generation connections. AMO will then also determine the nodes where system strength will be proactively provided by the TNSP. TNSPs plan to meet the standard, taking into account AMO's forecast, and then we'll go and build network assets or contract with non-network solutions to meet their obligations under the standard. And you can see that process on the right, with AMO's role in yellow and TNSPs in blue, and it leads to TNSPs providing system strength required to meet that standard. The key benefits of this coordinated approach are threefold in its promotion of the national energy objective. The first is the proactive investment of system strength to meet a standard through well-established planning processes. The second is efficient investment as TNSPs utilise economies of scope and scale to support the connection and operation of new connections in efficient areas of the power system. Last but not least is the evolution of the definition of system strength away from just being fault current allows to capture all the different aspects of voltage waveform stability and therefore allows for the most efficient and effective mix of solutions to be uh, pro to provide the service to be used by the TNSP. Moving on to our third and final recommendation, the efficient coordination of supply and demand. There is a need to create incentives to efficiently coordinate the supply and demand of system strength. And that's why we've recommended the introduction of a system strength mitigation requirement. This will involve the existing do no harm arrangements. The core idea is for new, generating, con uh, new connecting generators to contribute to the overall cost of providing system strength within what we are calling system strength zones which is these areas where the supply side is being applied. This cost contribution from newly connecting generators will be based on the marginal cost of the additional system strength required by the system to support that new generator. This marginal cost includes an impact component and a locational component, which I'll talk about in a moment. Outside of these zones where system strength is not being provided by TNSPs, the Commission has recommended retaining the existing system strength self-remediation requirement. So we have three design principles for this mitigation requirement to promote the NEO. The first is the sending of clear investment and locational price signals, and this will incentivize generators to install equipment that further reduces their demand for system strength, or in fact to suppliers, as well as locate efficiently, for example, in areas where system strength has been proactively provided for those generators who demand it and for those who supply it to connect in those areas where it needs to be supplied. Second is the sharing of costs of system strength between customers and generators. The Commission considers that both parties receive a benefit from the provision of system strength and it's on that basis that both should bear the cost of providing this service. Last but not least is transparency, predictability and simplicity. And this is to make sure that we are sending investment signals in a way that can actually be most appropriate for new generators connecting into the system. So a core component of the mitigation requirement is the use of these system strength zones. The boundary limit of a zone may be thought of as the connection point at which a generator can no longer benefit from the available system strength as provided by the TNSP from the supply side. This will be due to its large electrical distance as distinct from geographic distance from the source of system strength in these system strength nodes and zones. When an IBR generator connects within these system strength zones, it is required to either pay a charge proportional to its system strength impact, or it can request a full impact assessment and undertake its own self-remediation. We would expect this self-remediation to be at a significantly higher cost as TNSPs can realise the economies of scope and scale through that planning standard. 
The charge that these generators would have to pay will be determined by the following formula, which we have in an illustrated manner in the colourful way below. The blue total generator charge in dollars would be equal to the system strength impact charge that TNSPs would calculate as approved by the AER and published a few years in advance. The yellow would be the system strength need of each generator and specific to that generator. And the locational factor would be the electrical distance of that generator from the node. Now, when IBR generators connect outside of these system strength zones, it would be required to undertake a full impact assessment and self-remediated system strength impact such that it can operate stably. This is similar to the existing do no harm arrangements. Synchronous and grid forming inverter based generators whose supply system strength will be incentivized to locate inside the system strength zones and provide their services to the relevant TNSP through contracts. So to wrap up in our next steps on system strength work program going forward, we're going to continue to engage with stakeholders as well as undertaking a series of technical working group sessions to gain further input and develop the implementation details of our recommended reforms I've talked through today. We'll continue to work very closely with the ASB, AEMO and the AER on these recommendations, given this work is being coordinated with the post-2025 market reform work. These engagements will inform the draft determination of Transgrid's efficient management of power of system strength on the power system, rule change which we are due to publish in December of this year. I want to thank you for your time and welcome any questions during the Q&A or reach out to us if you have any questions on these reforms or next steps. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name is Sorel Grogan and I'll be taking us through the Model and Tools section of the workshop. We'll be looking at where we are and where we're going. Before we go further, it's important to take a moment to appreciate the difference between generation types in the NIM, namely synchronous versus asynchronous generation. Synchronous generators are like hydro, gas, coal, and even solar thermal, which at their core have a rotor that is spinning in synchronism with the grid. These synchronous generators can be represented in computer models and simulations very accurately using simplified mathematical equations with a high degree of confidence that will know how they'll respond under almost all scenarios. On the other hand, we have asynchronous generators and devices, uh, sometimes referred to as inverter-based resources. These are devices like photovoltaic solar, statcom, battery storage systems, and most modern wind turbines. These are seriously fast and sensitive devices, and they're capable of substantially changing their output in a fraction of a second, even for the tiniest change in the grid. They use software controllable power electronic switches as the interface between their energy source and the grid. And because their response is so tightly coupled to the way that they've been programmed, we can't necessarily represent their behavior using only simplified mathematical equations like we could with the synchronous generators. Instead, we need to represent all of their very fast control systems, which means that in our models, we typically need to represent the actual software that's running on the real units in the field. This is especially important in a weak grid or where there are many asynchronous devices clustered together. As we'll see, different modeling tools are better suited at doing this than others. With that understanding in our minds, let's take a look at the power system modeling space, namely EMT or electromagnetic transient models such as PSCAD models versus RMS or root mean square models such as PSSE dynamic studies. Whilst both types of models have been around for a very long time, RMS models were the tool of choice for assessing grid dynamics for many decades and EMT models were only ever considered a specialist tool for a limited set of studies. More recently, however, EMT models are being used to perform traditional grid dynamic studies, and I'll explain why. The major difference between the two is, that, is what can be re represented in a simulation. Born out of the necessity for simplification when computer power was hard to come by, um, RMS models greatly simplify both the plant models and the representation of the voltage and current in the grid. This was fine when the system had a lot of synchronous generation whose response could be accurately described by simplified mathematical equations. But as we get more and more inverter-based resources in the grid, a problem arises with RMS models. 
See, RMS models need to simplify out the components of inverter-based resources that are critical for assessing the stability of those very resources. In particular, the phase lock loop and the fast converter control in inverters that are critical for stability. But RMS models just aren't able to represent those compo components, nor are they able to represent the elements of the grid that those components require as an input. I'm talking about the actual sinusoidal voltage waveform, which the PLL and the fast converter controllers use as an input. So this is obviously a problem. How can we tell if an inverter is going to be stable if we can't represent the components and the inputs strongly strongly related to their stability. Well, that's where EMT models come in. Um, they can represent both the components of the inverters that strongly determine stability and the inputs those components need, that is the actual sinusoidal voltage waveform of the grid. EMT models can also allow actual source code running out there in the field to be encapsulated and run in these models, which gives greater confidence that the full model performance can be captured in dynamic simulation studies. So to summarize, it was the inability of RMS models to capture the components of inverters which are critical to evaluate their stability that's forced us to move to a modeling type that can, which is EMT models. To demonstrate the variation that can be seen between RMS and EMT models in a weak grid scenario, we've got a few examples on the screen here. The example on the left shows in a weak grid scenario what happens when a fault is applied nearby to a high voltage DC converter. You can actually see that the RMS model shows that everything is fine, it returns back to normal, whilst the EMT model shows that the, uh, the HVDC link has actually suffered a commutation failure. So it's a very, very big difference, especially in a weak grid scenario, between these two modelling packages. On the right, we have an example again where we have an area with a large amount of inverter-based resources and a credible contingency is applied. The EMT model shows that following clearance of that fault, there is a sustained oscillation that is present in the system, whilst the RMS model shows that everything returns back to a perfect steady state. So you can see here that RMS models tend to be very optimistic in weak grid scenarios, whilst EMT models are more likely to represent what is actually going to happen in the real grid. So to summarize, why are we moving to EMT? It's because EMT models allow us to understand how inverter-based resources and asynchronous devices will actually perform out in the field because they're able to represent all of the elements listed here. However, it's not all sunshine and rainbows moving to an EMT modeling world. There are a couple of undeniable uh, disadvantages of moving to an EMT platform such as PSCAD that we currently use. Um, firstly, as mentioned earlier, these EMT models are really highly detailed. That means there's a lot of intellectual property contained within them. That means it's really not easy for us to be able to distribute these models to the people who may want to run them for connection studies or system security work. That introduces this information sharing paradox of how on earth can I solve the problem if I'm not allowed to see what the problem is. Additionally, because again, they are very highly detailed, uh, this means that they may require additional computing power to be able to run in a reasonably fast time frame. And because they do run quite a lot slower than traditional RMS studies, that is PSSC dynamic studies, it means it's a lot more challenging to run the same suite of studies that you would normally run in the time frame available. However, we're not just throwing our hands up in the air and saying this is all too hard. Um, there are a number of initiatives that are ongoing. Um, in terms of the information dissemination problem, uh, we have found a way that we can share the mainland, AEMO's mainland PSCAD model to the various different network service providers around the country. And this will allow them to be able to use the same model that AEMO uses when doing their connection studies and system security analysis. We also ran a proof of concept uh, called Open Open access connections. The idea here is that a, um, a developer or a proponent can connect into AEMO's secure system, run their connection studies in a secure environment without being able to see the contents of their competitor's plant. Um, this proof of concept has currently been paused while we work out a way to be able to scale this up to a commercial level such that many more people can access it. 
In terms of speed increase and the speed increase problem, um, AEMO has recently engaged OpalRT to see whether their HyperSim platform, which is a real-time simulation platform, is capable of running existing PSCAD models, that is without any need to uh, get more information from the industry, uh, whether they can run these existing models in their HyperSim platform and how much faster it actually runs. The HyperSim platform also had has an additional advantage in that it supports enhanced model encryption and can also be used in the same way that PSCAD was used in the open access connections tools. So looking at a couple of different options there in terms of how we can get the information securely to the people who need to have it and how we can get PSCAD or EMT models more generally to run a lot faster. We also recognise that we may not have all the answers we need within Australia. Um, AEMO is currently involved in a number of international discussions focusing on uh, what happens when there's a large amount of inverter-based resources in a network system and when system strength is decreasing. We're involved a lot in CGRE, but in particular, these two CGRE working groups we are very active in, looking at how EMT simulation can be used on a large scale, and also looking at how real code from uh, inverters out there in the field can be encapsulated in EMT models to simplify both development and to improve confidence of EMT model performance. We also have regular discussion with our inter uh, independent system operator friends around the world, as listed here, uh, as they too are starting to see some unusual phenomena developing in their grid and they're looking towards what can be done in the EMT modeling space. So this concludes my presentation. Thank you all very much.